I want to thank everybody that's been supporting me recently. Um, whether you're a subscriber, you're liking, you're commenting, um, following me on Instagram or Twitter, buying my book. Any way that you're supporting me, I'm very appreciative. And I get a flurry of direct messages on Instagram and Facebook. And I see them. I cannot respond to all of them immediately. Don't think I'm ignoring you. I'm appreciative of every single person that supports me. And I will get back to you eventually. I'm busy right now. The documentary is in post-production. Um, I'm collaborating with my favorite novelist on a horror movie right now. We've been developing a script. Uh, we're trying to have that done by October. And I get my new novel. And then I'm a new dad. So it's just, I I'm overwhelmed right now. And <clears throat> I don't have a lot of time. And I appreciate the support. If you want to send me money on the GoFundMe, I'll leave the link below. Um, and if you can't afford that and you already bought one of my books, if you can leave a review on Amazon or on Audible, that helps tremendously. And if you haven't bought a book, but you are supportive of me and you believe in what I'm doing, if you can just take your favorite video and share it on your social media or text it to some people, help me expand this channel, that is help in itself. And I really, really appreciate you. So this is part two of my five years in federal prison. So when we left off in the last video, I had it good. I was in a hospital. I had one of those foldable beds and I was eating, you know, French toast, pancakes. They'd let me fill out a menu. Most importantly, they're tapering me off the methadone. They're giving me the methadose pills, the little 10 milligram white pills, and they're tapering me off comfortably in the hospital. But my attorney comes and he tells me that he can't put me in front of my judge to go for bail unless I'm out of the hospital. So I go against medical advice and I sign myself out and they, you know, the U.S. Marshals take me back to Metropolitan Detention Center, Los Angeles. And... As I explained in the last video, I go to court the next day and I'm throwing up in court. They like have a trash bag for me. I'm vomiting as the judge is denying me bail, telling me there's no way that he's going to let a drug addict of my level go back onto the street because I'll, you know, look at the condition I'm in. I obviously I need to be here. So bail gets denied. Unequivocally, I'm not getting bail. So now I'm at MDCLA and they have me celled up with some older white guy and he was in there for he was running like medical marijuana dispensaries in LA and he got busted this is back in 2009 when they were still waging wars on medicinal marijuana out here in California it was happening all the time they were raiding these dispensaries and he fell victim to that and he's kind of a weird guy and at this place um I don't know how many inmates there were probably 80 to 100 in my unit. And this is a two-tier building, two-man cells. They have phones, they have computer terminals where you can use email, and then there's like a desk where the cop sits. And there's probably six white guys out of the entire population of inmates. And honestly, like they're like the sorriest white guys ever. They're like all old. None of them have like a convict mentality, and it's not... Um, the kind of guys that I can count on to back me up. It's predominantly Southsiders. So you got, um, you know, different, you have Hawaiian Gardens was there. Um, they had eight, 18th Streeters, um, a whole bunch of different Southern California Hispanic gang members, Southsiders, Sereños. And there were Paisas, probably 10% of the population was Paisas. And then maybe 30% was, was Blacks and Crips and Bloods, but they run together in the feds. The Crips and Bloods are, are kind of together. I mean, the head of the Crips has a shot collar, the head of the Bloods has a shot collar, and if something happens within those factions, it's dealt with internally. Blacks are definitely the least structured out of all the races, and I'm, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because the more structure you get, the more people get hurt over bad calls, which I'll go into. People get hurt all the time in prison because the shot caller makes a bad call. You know, maybe somebody accuses someone of being a rat and the shot caller says, okay, we need to take this guy out. And they go remove him, they stab him or stomp him out, come to find out later that it was bad information. And in, in prison, you shouldn't ever make those kind of decisions 
about someone being a rat or a sex offender unless you see it on paper. Paperwork is everything. Even though, as I explained um, when I was on 23 and 1, for some of these high-level snitches, they doctor paperwork while you're in prison. But there's a way to run anybody's record and figure out if they're a rat. It's called pacer.gov, P-A-C-E-R.gov. What that is, is it's a federal docket website. And every time you go to court, they do a docket entry and they will let you know what the purpose of that court date was on that docket entry. So <clears throat> when you go to plead guilty, it'll say plea. When you go for sentencing, it'll say sentencing. But if you're proffering, which is debriefing, if you're snitching like this Takashi 6 9 punk is doing right now, it'll say a downward departure for proffer. So it'll be 5K1 or Rule 35. So you can look up anybody's case on pacer.gov, and if there's a Rule 35 or 5K1, then you know that they're a rat. And it'll also say the charge. So even though they doctor people's paperwork, you can still have family members run people's information from the outside. In state prison and in federal prisons that I've been to, they have what's called an RC. It's a roll call list. You put your name, your alias, your birth date, and it's for the sole purpose of being able to run your paperwork and figure out if you're a sex offender or if you're a snitch. So when I was at this place, MDCLA, um, I had, you know, my, my case had 109 co-defendants, and that's what... The majority of people in MDCLA at that time were part of these either RICO or conspiracies. So I was on this big cartel conspiracy, but then there were all these like Crips on Crip RICO cases. The Mongol bikers were on a RICO case. And basically the Southsiders came up to me. I'm sick. As soon as I get out of the hospital, methadone lasts about 24 hours. So after the 24, and I was already sick the next day in court, but now we're a full day after. And you do not sleep when you're kicking methadone, at least in the beginning. You do not sleep at all. You're almost electrified by the withdrawal. And so I'm kind of just laying in bed. And this guy that, um, that I'm celled up with, he has the bottom rack even though I'm sick. He thinks because he's older than me, he deserves it somehow. He's just an asshole. I always give somebody sick or somebody older than me the bottom rack. I mean, that's just proper jail prison etiquette. But I was on the top bunk, and one of the Southsiders, this guy, Chenny, he was from Hard Times Fontana, which is a gang out there. I think he was on a Rico or something. Um, he came to me, and he basically asked me if I wanted to move in with him, even though he was a Southsider. And, you know, I'm, I'm totally naive about prison. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. And I think the reason that he wanted me to move in with him is because, you know, Jenny was sending me insane amounts of commissary money. So I'm, I have a bunch of commissary, plus I had commissary from the stuff I'd brought in. So I think that this guy wanted me to move in just because I had money. And he knew that if he moved me in that he'd, you know, reap the benefits of my money. So he explained that if I moved in with him, that I'd be a resident Southsider, which means that I basically have to follow a Southsider program. It's called a homie program, Southsider program. And I've never run resident Southsider any other time in prison except for 2009 at MDCLA. The only reason I did it and he kind of explained it to me, he showed me this like sorry group of like dilapidated white guys they're like in canes wheelchairs it's like seriously if anything ever cracks off i am screwed nobody's gonna back me up not this group of people it's like a you know it's like elderly dope fiends so he explains if i live with him i'll be a resident southsider and they'll basically back me up if anything's gonna crack off and in california because the politics are so radical, because there's so many street gangs and everything's so racially divided, there's a really good chance something will pop off. So I make the decision to basically be a resident Southsider, move into this guy's cell. And he doesn't give me the bottom bunk either. I'm on the top bunk and I'm laying there all day long. I can't even eat. There's no way I can eat. My withdrawal symptoms 
before when I was feeling them cold turkey were severe, but I'd say this was like three or four times more severe. Um, I'm not hallucinating anymore, but like I said, I'm electrified by withdrawal. I feel like a third degree burn victim. So I'm like just thrashing in my bunk and like I'm moaning because it feels like bones are coming out of my skin. Like it feels like the bones are literally like just breaking apart. And I'm just sitting there moaning and thrashing and I end up getting a radio and that really helped. The radio offered me a lot of solace and relief and I just would listen to music all day and try to lose myself in the music thrashing. So we're like on day two now where I'm living with this guy, Chenny. Now, second day, he's already like, you know, these guys are eating these big spreads, putting $30 into a meal. Every time him and his like homies are eating, he's like, hey, Ryan, uh, I need you to put 25 bucks in. We'll put the rest in. So I just have like these big bags of commissary. I'm just like, yeah, yeah whatever. They're making food with my stuff and I'm not even like I'm so incoherent and sick that I don't even care. They try to give me bowls of the stuff and I'm just like, I don't want it. Um, I realized, you know, lights go go off at around nine o'clock. So you have the ability, you have a light switch in your cell. These are two man cells. They come and lock the door manually at nine o'clock. And the Southsiders program is like, they're quiet at nine. Everybody's quiet. Like you can hear a pin drop at nine o'clock in federal prison. And even though this is a detention center and I haven't gone to like a main fed yard yet, I'm, I'm still awaiting pretrial. I'm awaiting sentencing. Um, it really does act as a prison. This guy, Chenny had been there three years. There's guys in there that have been there eight years. Some people, if you get smaller sentences, you can finish your sentence at this place. So it's run like a prison. They have an outside recreation yard with like a basketball hoop and like downtown LA is right there. You can hear all the traffic and everything in the picture from the, from part one of this video, you can see like the little cages on the building. Those are the rec yards. And so I'm not leaving the cell though. I'm just in the cell. And what I found out is that jerking off is the only thing that makes you feel better because your dopamine has been depleted so much that it's affecting your serotonin. So when you jerk off, while you're jerking off, you're getting serotonin release. And when you come, it's amplified, but then you instantly get propelled back into withdrawal. So I'm jerking off as much as I can. And that's problematic when you have a celly. And it's like literally the only relief that I can get. So when he's not in the cell, the way you jerk off in like that kind of cell in, in the feds, is you get a towel and you throw it over your door and it covers the window and then you can shut the door and the wind in like the, the glass, the plastic part, the opening, the window is covered by the towel and then you can just jerk off. Even though porn's outlawed in the feds, they have like American Curbs magazine and they have like Maxim was good back then. So like in the day, as much as I could, I would put the towel up. You do that if you're shitting too. It's not just some flag for masturbating. It's also for if you're taking a shit. So I'd jerk off all day, but then when the lights went off, I'd still want to get my momentary relief. So I'd literally have to, like I'd have my radio on and I'd like take an earbud out and I'd like hear him breathing and I, I could discern if it was sleep or if he was just breathing. So I could figure out if he was sleeping. So I'd like creep the earbud off and I'd like erect a tent with my blanket. So I'd use one knee to make like a tent so that I could do like a little motion without being detected. I mean, you don't want people to like, you don't want, you want to try to conceal this motion. And everybody knows when you're sick, you come in like 10 seconds, if not less. So I'm just sitting there and I'm just like, and then I'll just come. And then as soon as I come, I do the, the old, the classic fake cough. Like I'll come and go, because <coughs> I don't want that, like, you know, that, that little groan <coughs> to come out. So I'm like, <coughs> and then I'll just, you know, have the, like a little piece of toilet paper, clean it up. And then I'm just so sick. I don't even go and flush down the toilet. I just hide it under my mattress. So I have all these little jizz napkins all underneath my napkin. And by the way, incidentally, this guy, Chenny, is like a straight up psychopath. Within the first week that I'm in there, I see him get in a fight 
and he hits someone in the face and he breaks their jaw in three places. He hits it right there and it literally comes apart. Gets a, this guy gets a compound fracture. Some guy, I guess he was like a cell thief. He was going around stealing from people. So I knew this guy was a psychopath. If I got caught jerking off in his cell, this guy was going to murder me. But it was the only relief that I could get. So I was just chronically masturbating. Seriously, sitting there staring out the window because they have these little like thin windows about that big at MDCLA in the cell and you can see downtown Los Angeles. You can get nail clippers and like hit it against the window when you see a hooker down on the sidewalk and they can hear just the little reverberation of the nail clippers and they'll flash you. So they were doing that all the time and um, you know I'm on my covert masturbation you know operations up in this bunk hoping that this psychopath Southsider doesn't hear me and, and murder me. It doesn't get any better. My skin's crawling. I'm vomiting all the time. I'm literally crying so much because I'm in so much misery that I have no more tears to expel. So I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm crying, but no tears are coming out and I'm rocking back and forth on the toilet with my, with my pants around my ankles and this guy Chenny is just laughing at me you know he's he's never done heroin or methadone he has no idea what what kicking is but it's kind of laughing at me you know because I'm in so much misery and I'm just kind of brushing it off because I can't even really comprehend the fact that I'm in this situation all I can focus on is the pain now they say that you're a psychonaut that's like a proverbial term the proverbial um, psychonaut it's like almost like you're some psychedelic astronaut. It's a term applied for people that like take, you know, hallucinogenic drugs and go catapult themselves into another universe and they come out intact. It's called like, being able to navigate the psychedelia is being called a psychonaut. I think the, this level of kicking is like almost the same thing, but it's like in the abysmal depths of like the ocean. Instead of being up in psychedelic space, you're like in the abyss of the ocean of just complete pain it's almost so painful that it's a spiritual experience anyone that's ever kicked methadone cold turkey can definitely attest to this it you you have to sit there and almost meditate concentrate on the breathing because the pain is so severe it's if if i had to quantify it in a number i'd say it's a probably 50 times worse than heroin withdrawal heroin withdrawal is no fun so i'm really going through it and Every night, I'm up all night listening to my music, beating off when I can get away with it, which is pretty frequently. I mean, I'm beating off five, six times an hour, firing off blanks, you know, and I'll feel better while I'm doing it, and then instantly, I'm thrown back into withdrawal. And I remember those nights, they were so lonely, and I'd watch the sun come up in this little tiny window, and I was so sad. And... You know, they're having me periodically do medical appointments. And, you know, I'll have to get dressed. You wear these green scrubs and like these almost like flip-flops that look like shower shoes. And they take you on an elevator and you go on different, like you go to a medical appointment downstairs. You go to dental. You have to do all these like intake exams like you would do in any other prison. But just going to these things while I was sick as I was was just absolutely torturous. And there's really violent stuff going on around me. People are getting beat up all the time. But I'm so preoccupied with kicking the methadone that I really don't pay any attention to it. I'm not even aware enough to know that this is a really dangerous place. I'm just, you know, my Sally Chenny would come and tell me, oh man, this dude just got stabbed upstairs. It's crazy. And I'm just like, yeah, okay. like I, I can't even really comprehend what's going on so one day probably like 10 days into the kick now and I have not slept and even if I do sleep it's not real sleep it's kind of like if you've been up on meth for a bunch of days straight where you go like have these little cat naps that are like 10 seconds but they feel like they're hours long and I'll just keep nodding in and out of consciousness my attorney comes to see me and I have to go into like the visit room, same visit room you would see your family members. It's a contact visit. So you can actually like kiss your girlfriend or wife, hug your parents. You're allowed two hugs, you know, beginning a visit, end of visit, and a kiss beginning and end if it's your significant other. Um, and my attorney comes to see me and he says that the, he, he, 
he shows me a piece of paper and there's a name written on it and it's Sass's name, Sass's real name. If you guys remember who Sass is from how I made half a million dollars in a year, uh, that was my big Molly connection. And he, he, my attorney gives me his real name. They said, this is who they want. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? He said, they want you to debrief and tell them what your relationship is with this guy and what he has going on because they know, they know, but they just need, they need somebody to cooperate against him. And before I could even say anything, I was going to say no. My attorney says, it's against my religion. I would never help put another person in jail. And even though this guy burned me, I fundamentally oppose snitching. I think it's one of the worst things you can do to another human being. That is, honestly, that's some punk shit, you know? And so that was the one and only time after my arrest that he mentioned anything like that to me. And that was it. What he told me is that my case was going to be complicated because I was on a conspiracy with 109 other people. Originally, it was like 44, but then there were superseding indictments with other sweeps. And he said, you're looking at 10 to life or 5 to 40. And so I I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, there's different brackets for drug possession and for conspiracies. And they have you categorized right now in the 10 to life bracket because you were caught both, you know, two different times with a half pound. So collectively, it's a pound. And he recommended that I read a book called Busted by the Feds. It's a great book. A lot of people in federal prison have it. If you've never been to federal prison, but you want to know more about it in depth and about how that system works, I recommend that book. It's called Busted by the Feds. So he basically told me I was looking at 10 to life, but he was going to try to get it down to 5 to 40, that there are ways to try to make a deal with the government if they'll consolidate the bus into one bus, get it down to the 5 to 40 bracket, then I'll sign. So he said, best case scenario, you're going to get five. Worst case scenario, you're going to get 10. But he said, right now, they're not dropping the 10 thing. So just mentally prepare to do 10 years. And that translates to about eight and a half years of actual time. So on top of this overwhelming methadone withdrawal that I'm enduring, my double life as a midnight masturbator and everything else that's going on outside of this, I'm just completely engulfed in pain. It's almost palpable and warm. That's how much pain I'm in. I can almost feel the pain like it's an actual heat. It's just so emotionally daunting at the time that I'm, 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 I'm going through it. So I go back to my unit and I ask people for the Bust by the Feds book. And even though I'm sick, I start reading it and I start figuring out everything there is to know about federal prison. And there's so much stuff that they do that I'd never heard of that I think is just patently wrong. One thing that they can do that I learned from that book is they can convict you for something called ghost dope. And ghost dope means that if I tell somebody, like say I tell the the DEA or FBI, that guy sold me a pound of heroin but they never actually recovered any of the dope. Just off my testimony, even though I'm busted and I have an incentive to give them information anyway because I'll get a time reduction, just off that testimony alone, they can convict you. So there's people doing life sentences just based off testimony, and that's called ghost dope. And I'd never heard of that. I'd also never heard of getting arrested and being let go. I learned about that. I talked about that in the other video. They were just collecting the state arrest to build an indictment to present to the grand jury. And that's how I got indicted later. And then I found out how they do the sentencing. So in federal system, if you get caught with 100 to uh, 400 grams, yeah, 100 to 400 grams of heroin, it's five to 40 years in federal prison. If you get caught with anything over 400 grams, it's 10 to life. So right now they had me busted twice with 229 grams. I was over 400. I was looking at 10 to life. And the guidelines for crystal meth are way worse. If you get caught with five grams to 50, so five to 50 grams, that's five to 40. If you get caught with 50 grams or more of crystal meth, it's 10 to life. 
Now, I know this is confusing to a lot of people because you can go, well, my friend got busted with a pound of meth and he only did six years in state prison or whatever it is. You can get busted by state with two pounds of meth and it's not the same as the the federal guidelines. So it gets very confusing. And then on top of the amount of weight, they also have a criminal history, one through six. So they compartmentalize you in a criminal history level. And I ended up being a three, but whatever your level is, say you're a six, then they recommend something beyond five to 40 or more than 10 to life. And it's all in months. So say it's five years, 60 months. If you're a level six criminal, it's 72 months. So it's based on your criminal record plus the amount of drugs that you got caught for. So it started really um, teaching me what was going on with this system, even though I was sick. And so I continue making calls to my attorney when I can muster up the strength to get out of my cell. I'm literally like putting a blanket on me and just like walking out of the cell to the payphone, and I can I, ba- I can barely muster up the energy. I'm not really talking to Jenny, I'm not talking to my parents, but I am trying to talk to my attorney because I'm trying to figure out if like w- what's going to happen. And when he said that I'm looking at ten to life and I might do eight and a half years in federal prison, I mean it 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 scared the shit out of me, and I wanted to figure out what was going to happen. So now we're like two weeks into it, and my attorney's telling me that they're not budging from the 10 to life. So I'm mentally preparing for for doing the 10 years now. It's no longer a possibility, it's a probability. And one day I called Jenny. You know, I hadn't talked to her for a while. She's sending me letters, she's sending me pictures. And I call our landline. And I call it, and a guy picks up. And I'm like, hello? And the guy's like, hey, hey Ryan, you having fun in there? And he just starts laughing at me like this really evil laugh. Hey, you having fun in there? (laughs) And then just dial tone. My heart sank. I knew instantly she was cheating on me. I mean, she was getting increasingly more panicked in the emails or in the, uh, yeah, in the emails because we're doing core links and in the letters that she's sending me. She's telling me that she can't handle being alone. She's strung out by herself. And I thought it was just a matter of time because we were so codependent that you know, she was going to start cheating on me. And sure enough, that's what happened. So immediately I call my dad. Now remember, I had laundered a lot of my money in lithograph art. So I had well over two, three hundred, maybe four hundred thousand dollars worth of art all over my wall. And I told my dad, hey, Jenny's cheating on me. You need to get in your car and you need to go over there right now and get all my art. So my dad did. And I called him back later that night. You know, I'm still sick. I'm literally, I have to bring a bag with me to the phone. And I'm standing on the payphone, and every so often, bleh, people are just looking at me because I'm deathly ill. I mean, I'm, I'm shaking, I'm sick, I'm throwing up, diarrhea, uh, you know, m- masturbating until the wheels fall off. And so my dad tells me that he goes to, gen- to our house. We had the nice place in Santa Barbara. And that sure enough, there was a guy there. My dad said, a good looking guy at that. And he said he he was wearing a wife beater and he wouldn't let my dad in the house, but I was the one on the lease. So my dad eventually got in there and he recovered, I want to say maybe a quarter of my art collection. She got to, I had Hunter S. Thompson for sheriff signed by Hunter S. Thompson. I bought that for like five grand from some dealer in Aspen. I had a $30,000 Andy Warhol painting that my dad was able to get, or a lithograph. Um, I had some Andy Warhol soups. I had some Roy Lichtensteins. I had some Damien Hirst, Mel Ramos. So he recovered about a quarter of them. Now my, you know, now I'm calling my landline. I'm freaking out and Jenny just won't pick up. And my legal bills are stacking up. So my dad says he has to liquidate some of that art. So I was, I was working with this art broker down in Torrance, California, this guy named, I think, Rick Hancock. And he owned a company called ABI, ABI Art. And what I would do is I would buy these lithographs for cash. I'd go to an art dealer. Back then, I'd look in the yellow pages. And I'd find art dealers that were selling Roy Lichtenstein, Pablo Picasso lithographs. You get, I got a Pablo Picasso lithograph for 9000 Now, the value, the Christie Sotheby's value for this particular lithograph, it was called Jacqueline, um, 
I think it was like 16,000. And because I had cash, I was able to get it for much less. And then what I would do is I'd give it to this art broker and he'd sell it for 11,000. I'd make some profit, but what would happen is it would legitimize my money and it would wash my money and it would turn it from illicit drug money into money that I'm actually paying taxes on and there's no way to really regulate where I got that art. I could have gotten grandfather down from a relative. So it was like the best way I could think of to wash my money. So my dad, you know, these, these legal bills are getting really, really, really expensive. My attorney is saying one thing that we can do is get a psychological evaluation because I'm bipolar. If we can get that on paper, that can be considered a mitigating factor. Now you can't get below the mandatory minimums. These are mandatory minimums. You can't get below 10 to life. You can't get below five to 40, but you can try to get compassion from the U.S. attorney to switch you from the bracket from 10 to life to five to 40. And the whole thing was he got busted one day, then he comes back like within 48 hours to get it again. He's sick. That is a sickness. No one that thinks logically would do something like that. It's completely nonsensical. So that was, you know, our whole strategy. But to get one of these psychological evaluations, like 15,000 from somebody that would actually sway the courts. So all these charges were coming up and my dad tried to start liquidating this, this art. So he had already, like I said, he sold that Picasso. He sold a Roy Lichtenstein trip, triptych that I had. I think I sold that for 23,000 and I'd been doing business with him for a while. Well, he, I have this thing called Andy Warhol Witch from Myths 2, and it was an artist proof. So they only made like 100 of these, and I owned one, and it was $30,000. And I, I think it was $29,000. $29,000, and the thing was worth, I want to say, fifty. And so Rick got an offer for 40000 So my dad said, can I trust this guy? I said, yes, I want to be able to pay off these legal expenses. So my dad brings the, um, the lithograph down. It was framed. It was really cool. It's the Wicked Witch from Wizard of Oz. And it had, um, you know, it had like diamond dust. So it had like glitter on it. It was really cool. It was like my favorite piece I ever owned. It's called um, Witch from Myths to Andy Warhol. You can Google it. It's a really, really sick piece. And so he brings it to this guy. The guy gives him a contract. And about a week later, he says that he sells it. So he sends my dad a check for the money for 40000 and he doesn't sign the check. So he calls my dad and says, hey, I didn't sign the check. So my dad starts getting suspicious, and he starts putting pressure on him. All of a sudden, we get, my dad gets a letter in the, the mail that this guy filed for bankruptcy. He ran a Ponzi scheme on us and like 12 other people, and he got me for this twenty-nine or $30,000 piece. And that was a huge financial blow at the time because Jenny now is cheating on me, She's not talking to me and she has all the cash and we only have about a quarter of the art. So I'm really going through it. My girlfriend just cheated on me. I'm kicking methadone. Every night I'm listening to my celly sleep, jerking off when I can get away with it. And like I said, it's very frequent. And in my mind, I think I'm going to get 10 years in prison and that's not even taking into account the kind of extreme violence that I started being exposed to. And we'll cover that in part three of five years that I spent in federal prison. Thanks for checking out my video.